Okay, so we will start. <clears throat> okay, so let me start. So our second speaker of this session is uh, Joel Mua from Berkeley, and he is going to talk about integrable and near integrable spin chains in theory and reality. So please. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to have the opportunity to speak here, and it's unusual to have so many experts on unusual hydrodynamics, especially in one dimension, uh, in one place, even if we're all in different time zones. Uh, and so not everyone is as awake as everyone else. I think uh, there should be a good conversation because what I want to talk about is a little bit different. I, I realize this is a theory institute and mostly a theory conference. Um, I'm mostly going to talk about how we take this beautiful structure of hydrodynamics of integrable models that's been understood in the last five years or so and confront it a bit with uh, reality, uh, where reality means either experimental reality in a solid or numerical checks uh, in various cases. And you might ask, why are we doing that if we believe the theory is right? I mean, certainly before all this, I, I believe the theory was right. Um, I guess the main point is that the real world is, is not integrable, usually, at least not in solids. Um, so we basically understand uh, the stability of this kind of hydrodynamics to various perturbations that are out there in the real world. Um, and the main highlight, which I think I'll get to in the first half of the talk, is that uh, basically, with some experimentalists, we went back and looked at one of the classic one-dimensional spin chain compounds. In other words, a three-dimensional compound with one-dimensional structure, this potassium copper fluoride, and re-examined and, and took some new neutron scattering data. And there is um, quite interesting evidence for super diffusive behavior. So I'll remind everyone, I realize not everyone is coming from the same niche of hydrodynamics. Uh, I'll remind everyone why that was expected starting, or at least a possibility starting in 2019 or so, and, and go back a little bit earlier as well. Um, but it's nice that, you know, in, in solids, in a place where people never really looked before, there is evidence for this unusual hydrodynamics. So that's uh, the first part. Um, so a reason for caring, I guess, is that there is sort of a standard assumption um, in solid state physics, where I come from, that systems relax to the Gibbs ensemble, um, the local Gibbs ensemble, and then maybe at some longer time, you get hydrodynamical equations that describe the evolution of the system from local Gibbs ensemble to global Gibbs ensemble. Um, but there are various ways around that. I mean, one famous way that's been big in the last decade is many body localization means you just don't reach equilibrium in any conventional way. Um, the possibility that's more interesting here is that the nature of equilibrium is modified because the system is integral. Um, so I'll, I'll mention more history along the way, but these are the main papers from my group that I'll be talking about. Um, one is from a couple of years now, but the new stuff is in this bottom slide. Um, and it's really about largely the Heisenberg point and other sort of integrable isotropic points and spin chains um, and how they do seem to have a uh, new sort of hydrodynamic behavior that was conjectured as far as I know, only starting in 2019. Um, all right. So the second part is to ask more generally, you know, now that we've understood in the first part, maybe that at least in solids, you can see some integrable dynamics, maybe when you wouldn't expect it. Uh, and in particular, uh, dynamics that really depends on, on quantum mechanics in a certain way that I'll talk about. Um, you might ask, well, in other systems that people look at where there are perturbations to integrability, can you st still see evidence of interesting hydrodynamics? So the second part of the talk is, is more theoretical. Um, the first is on what's basically the leading perturbation in most quasi one dimensional solids. If you ignore coupling between the chains, like suppose you might have an atomic system where you just have one chain or something, um, then you can have perturbations that are uh, just additional terms in the Hamiltonian that may be small, but are important because they break the integrability. Or if you're dealing with atomic systems, you often have a trap and another kind of integrability breaking is just the existence of the trap generally, not always, spoils the integrability of the model. And then I'm going to try to give just a tiny bit of the relevant history, but I can't do it justice. Um, as far as I know, I know of one review article that covers all the, the recent stuff, maybe there are others, but I would point people who want to know more to this review of uh, Bolchandani, Gopalakrishnan, and Ilyevsky. All right, so as I mentioned, um, a lot of our basic theory of solids is built on the idea of the Gibbs ensemble. Um, there are other possibilities, and I'm going to focus about integrable systems of Yang-Baxter types and remind you that those have infinitely many conservation laws and how that is a uh, problem, at least it, it means that the ordinary structure of standard hydrodynamics uh, would not work very well. 
And actually for spin systems, we usually use an even simpler form of hydrodynamics than Navier-Stokes. We just tend to assume that spin is diffusive um, and it probably is on very long time scales, uh, but not on the time scales of the experiment I'll talk about. Um, and again, the big question is to try to understand you know, less as a mathematical question and more as a question about the real world, to what extent does the integrable behavior um, survive once you start to perturb the system? So the uh, starting point for diffusion, uh, I think, let me go back to some work of Einstein on Brownian motion and a very fundamental relationship that turns out not to be specific to his problem or even to classical physics. Uh, the idea is that if I look at a heavy particle moving in a fluid, the problem of Brownian motion, um, then if I have more heavy particles in one region than another, I see diffusion to reduce the density gradient. And the diffusion constant can be expressed as an integral over an equilibrium correlation function. Um, and the philosophy behind this uh, is basically that how a system returns to equilibrium doesn't care very much about whether it fluctuated away from equilibrium because of thermal fluctuations or because it was driven away by some external perturbation. So that's how linear response in general can be computed through equilibrium correlation functions, and we do this all the time, even for quantum systems. Um, but there are assumptions here about the return to equilibrium. Um, so the way we might think about this a little bit more abstractly and connect it to spin, and I'm going to focus on spin because that's where the experiment is. Um, if I think about a simple evolution equation for a system with a conserved number of particles, uh, I might be led to the diffusion equation. And the Solution of that that's relevant for our purposes is think about a small lump of particles at the origin. As time goes by, a solution is the spreading Gaussian with width spreading like the square root of time. Um, the way that translates to magnetism is very simple. When we think about, say, magnetism on a lattice, we're going to go to some long distance continuum limit. Let's assume that some direction of the magnetization is conserved. Then what I might expect. Um, if there is no, say, conservation of the spin momentum or something like that, if basically spin is just moving like a random walk, but it is conserved, that I will get spin diffusion with the dynamical exponent uh, z equal to two. Dynamical exponent is the, if you like, the exponent relating spatial, time, spatial scales and time scales. Um, so this is seen in a lot of experiments. I won't explain why. Uh, I, I won't explain more detail on that, but that's kind of the, the null hypothesis. Um, but a different possibility happens if you have momentum conservation in a fluid like air or water. Then you have, in general, what we would say uh, three conservation laws, actually. Um, so when two particles collide in air or water, the number of particles is conserved, the momentum of the particles is conserved, and the energy of the particles is conserved. And that leads to three basic equations of fluid mechanics, which in the simplest case, sort of zeroth order, uh, look like this. And these can be derived from the Boltzmann equation, but they have uh, less information than the Boltzmann equation because these are basically equations for the first three moments of the one particle distribution, while the Boltzmann equation is about the full one particle distribution. But anyway, what these equations basically describe is, let's say that local equilibrium has set up after just a couple of collision times, less than a microsecond in typical fluids. That means that there is a local particle density, a local momentum, and a local energy, well, free energy density, and those uh, three quantities are sufficient to characterize the local state of the fluid, then hydrodynamics, by my definition, is how that evolves on, on longer times, which can be many orders of magnitude. Um, so now let's talk about systems where we can at least tell that standard hydrodynamics would not work. Um, probably the simplest example of a quantum system is just bosons moving in 1D with the delta function interaction, the so-called Lieb-Linegar model. The one I'm going to focus on more here is uh, the X, X, Z spin chain. So these are spin half operators on a one-dimensional lattice. Um, I'm later on going to add a staggered magnetic field, which is the last term, but don't worry about that for now. That will be used to break the integrability. Um, let me just focus on these first two terms. And when I say Heisenberg point, that just means that JXX is equal to JZ. Um, an easy solvable case is JZ equal to zero then this winds up being equivalent to free fermions through the Jordan-Wigner transformation. Um, in general, with Jz not equal to zero, it's interacting and quite interesting, but a great deal has been known about the thermodynamics. Um, and basically the thermodynamics were solved in the 1970s. What's surprising is that uh, the dynamics were not really understood until the last 10 years or so. And, very, and various, you know, very basic questions about the dynamics of this model uh, were you know, that, that probably could have been answered a while ago were not. 
So when I say there are an infinite number of conserved quantities in integrable models, um, for the XXZ model, say you could just write down uh, more and more complicated combinations of spin operators um, that solve that that have conservation equations with each other. Um, so this is the the first couple of non-trivial conserved charges and conserved currents. Um, one interesting thing about this model, which is a bit, a bit special, is that one conserved charge is also a conserved current. If you look at that, P2 is minus 2Q3. Um, but in general, these look quite painful to deal with. Um, so it'd be nice to find a formalism where you don't really have to deal with them directly. And that is true of the hydrodynamic formalism I'll talk about. It turns out you know, there are other ways to get exact results on this problem, um, but I don't think any of them is as general as the sort of hydrodynamical approach. So when I say that the dynamics was not really understood, I think a lot of things started about 10 years ago with the realization uh, by Prozen that um, many of the conserved quantities of the model had basically been missed, uh, including the ones that are important for spin dynamics. Um, and that explained uh, or was easy to confirm in numerical results. Um, so I'm not going to go really into the details of um, what happened in the next three or four years after that, but it was possible to understand some things. And then along came a more general theory. Um, but let me go out of historical order for a couple of slides to kind of indicate where we're going. And then I will step back a bit. So the big surprise to me, at least, um, in this paper by Lubotina, Znadaric, and Prozen from 2019, was that the Heisenberg point dynamics um, are different from what you might have guessed and different from what people had guessed in many, many years of work on dynamics of the Heisenberg spin half spin chain. Um, the, the claim supported by numerics, and we see this in numerics as well, I don't think there's too much doubt about it, is that um, you get, first of all, a kind of super diffusive behavior with dynamical exponent z equal to three halves. In other words, um, spin spreads faster than diffusively, but slower than ballistically. And even the scaling functions um, have a better collapse on the cardar prezi zheng scaling function than they do on, say, diffusion. Um, so briefly, you know, what is this cardar prezi zheng Well, it's a famous universality class in classical soft condensed matter physics, say. It describes uh, many different things. Um, the easiest realization of it I know is this line here, the, the top one in the box, which is the noisy uh, Burgers equation in one plus one dimension. So I basically have diffusion on the left. On the right-hand side, I add some nonlinearity and I add a random driving term. Um, and it's now understood quite rigorously that that has this uh, different kind of physics that is not diffusion and has different exponents and is different in pretty much every way. Um, and the spin is connected to the derivative of the height field in this KPZ equation. So I want to talk about uh, the current state of evidence for that in solids that are quantum spin chains to a good approximation. Uh, but first, you know, where did this 2019 sort of come from? Uh, well, I guess uh, just to kind of draw a picture of what I'm talking about to make sure it's clear, and when I say super diffusion, I mean the blue curve. So things like spin are spreading faster than diffusion, which is the green curve, but slower than ballistic behavior, which is the red curve. Um, so you know, this is an example of one special case that you can solve pre the hydrodynamical era and compare to DMRG and it all works. So at least this gives you some confidence that the numerical techniques I'll be showing results from without any details seem to work. The top line is the Heisenberg point. So you could say, well, we knew one or two solvable cases of Heisenberg far from equilibrium dynamics already. Um, and while I, I, I like that work, uh, starting in 2015, there came along a different way to think about the dynamics of uh, this kind of problem. And I'm gonna focus on that. So I'm not gonna go through um, maybe where this kind of result came from, except to say that we know that it's possible to check many exact results on interacting systems against numerics and the numerics have only gotten better since 2015, and the analytic results have probably improved even more than the numerics. So when I say uh, hydrodynamical era, certainly hydrodynamics in, in classical models has a, a very long history, and it was well understood that one dimension is special. Um, and in fact, the kind of hydrodynamics that I'm gonna talk about in the next few slides actually appears very much in some classical nonlinear integral systems like the nonlinear Schrodinger model. But maybe the remarkable surprise is that it's a very good description of, of quantum integral systems as well. And that began with these uh, two papers I have here, which started with what was kind of the model problem, actually the sort of problem that I showed a second ago, this two reservoir quench 
where you just have a hot half of the system and a cold half of the system and you let them go. Um, but it turns out I'm going to try to convince you that it's, uh, it's good more generally. Um, and then come to the Heisenberg point where it's a little bit hard to get physical intuition. And one question yeah, that might come up is why is the Heisenberg point described by KPC? Um, and I, I think more detailed answers to that will be given by uh, N.A. and Roman Vasser, I hope, later in this meeting. Um, but so I'm not going to say too much about that, except uh, at least why you might expect the Heisenberg point is somewhere between diffusive and ballistic behavior. Um, but here, here's the basic idea of this hydrodynamic approach, which is easiest to explain in the easy plane case, which is Z equal to one. Um, but it doesn't quite tell you, I think it doesn't, at least to me, it doesn't logically lead in some immediate way to the 2019 idea that the Heisenberg point should be KPZ. Um, so the kind of equation that this leads to is a, is a very funny form of the Boltzmann equation with input that comes from the beta ansatz. And normally the Boltzmann equation has streaming on the left and let's say collision terms on the right. And for reasons I'll try to explain, there is really no collision term in these integral models. You don't randomize the momenta, but the particles do impact each other through the velocity. In other words, the velocity of one particle at one space-time point depends on how many other particles there are of all different momenta at the same space-time point. Um, so there's really no uh, true collision term, but there is an effect, this uh, modification of each other's velocities, which I'll show you a picture of that in classical physics, uh, which comes from this paper I put down at the bottom. Um, and then in quantum physics, it's related to the idea that quasi-particles moving through each other give each other a phase shift. Um, so the idea of this, uh, you know, why is there an effect that you could view as a delay? Well, in classical physics, it simply is a delay. So the picture on the bottom left is two solitons of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation passing through each other. And if you can make out the dotted lines on the bottom left, those are the paths that the solitons would have. So here time is horizontal axis and space is vertical axis. The dotted lines are the paths they would have if they were really independent of each other. Instead, they pass through each other far enough in a way they retain their shape and they retain their um, asymptotic velocity, but there was a time delay in how they got there. And quantum mechanically, well, we know that there's a phase shift rather than Maybe it's not so easy to think about that directly as a delay, but at least in semi-classical limits, we're used to thinking of changes in phase shift with energy as related to time delays. Um, and that's sort of what goes on in the quantum model. Um, so the, the real essence of integral models, which appears both in the thermodynamics and the dynamics, and for people who are not caring very much about integral models, uh, I thought I would just flash up one line from uh, Sutherland's book. Um, but the, the basic idea, which is relevant here is that normally, okay, it might be that normally if I were in one dimension with elastic collision, something like that picture would still work for two particles, even if I didn't have an integral model. The special thing about the integral model is not really two particles by themselves. It's that even when many particles come together, it's like a whole bunch of two particle collisions and it doesn't matter what order they occurred in. Uh, that's really the essence of the Yang-Baxter equation and integrability in case you're wondering, you know, what's so special about this particular class of models and why is the real world not usually in this class? Um, so a way to state, you know, in, in what I find really neat about this hydrodynamic formalism is that normally, as I, I tried to say, the hydrodynamical equations are just a different beast from the Boltzmann equation. They're about a different set of quantities. They're only the first three moments and therefore they have less information. But a way to think about this sort of Boltzmann or kinetic theory approach is that um, now, once we're talking about integral models, and it's easiest to write down formulas for lieb Liniger, the Bose gas, it's really like uh, hydrodynamics and kinetic theory are, are the same thing. Because if you had an infinite list of hydrodynamical equations, because you had an infinite list of conserved quantities, you would be dealing with all the moments of the one particle distribution. But under you know, our usual physical assumptions, uh, knowing all the moments of a function is basically equivalent to working with the function, which is kinetic theory. So kinetic theory and hydrodynamics are now essentially equivalent and kinetic theory is nice because it's one equation rather than some infinite hierarchy. Um, so it's surprising maybe that this works in uh, XXZ as well, where the conserved quantities are more complicated, but let me try to convince you that it does. So to kind of you know, state at a high level what the pictures I want to show you from numerics uh, are intended to convey. In a normal fluid, we reach local Gibbs ensemble and then have hydrodynamics. In an integrable fluid, we still are not solving sort of the quench problem. We're assuming that 
we're at high enough density and temperature and so on that I do rapidly reach a local generalized Gibbs ensemble. Um, and then the, the, that beta Boltzmann equation or kinetic theory or whatever, or generalized hydrodynamics, if you want to think of it in terms of Euler equations, that is all about uh, a flow on the space of local generalized Gibbs ensembles. Um, and that was solved, as I mentioned, in 2016. Um, and my point in the next slide or two is just numerically, if you look at long enough XT solutions, um, this is a very good description of what's going on microscopically, even though it's essentially classical particle physics and classical particle equations. So what I mean by that is, let's take an expansion of an initially hot region of the XXZ spin chain and compare a microscopic calculation called you know, density matrix normalization group, for those of you who are aficionados, and compare it to the hydrodynamical equations. And the point is the curves agree very well. It was a pleasant surprise to us that it seems like this hydrodynamical formalism um, is as accurate as the most accurate <clears throat> microscopic technique we have uh, for this kind of you know, many quantum particle in one dimension time evolution. Um, so that's all that I've said so far is basically about a sort of ballistic case where the particles are not free, but they are moving with the velocity. And while they delay each other, at least asymptotically, you would expect them to fly apart. We can capture the details of how they fly apart, but it's not the most strongly coupled fluid you could imagine. So what if we crank up the interaction a little bit more? And when I say I have only one slide on DMRG, um, which is just to explain why we think of this as making a very different set of approximations than any sort of integrable uh, method is. It's because DMRG is a way of approximating the wave function or a variational class of many body wave functions um, that keep local entanglement and reject global entanglement. So it's been a, you know, it was first invented in 1992, but it's gotten a lot better. Um, but the only, I'm not going to get into any more details, but I just want to convey that, you know, we know that there are approximations in that technique, but in one dimension, it's pretty good. And we know that whatever the approximations are, they're very different from, for example, the corrections to local GGE um, maybe Benjamin will talk about things like this that are probably the leading, uh, you know, ways that the that Boltzmann type equation is approximate. All right. So anyway, so this is just uh, you know trying to magnify that again. So we think this is a pretty good description of the ballistic case. Uh, but what about when we go to the last gapless point, which is the Heisenberg point? So a little bit about the XXZ phase diagram. The ground state is gapless when JXX is stronger than JZ. Um, it's still gapless at the Heisenberg point, but its nature changes a bit. And then it's gapped once it's easy axis, once JZ is the largest scale. And the, it's been known for a while and, and proven that uh, the easy axis regime is gapped and diffusive. Uh, what I just tried to show you was that the easy plane gapless regime is sort of ultimately ballistic, but we can say a lot more about it through this hydrodynamical approach. Um, so you might expect that the last gapless point, the Heisenberg point, is somewhere in between ballistic and diffusive. Um, and yeah, there, there are reasons actually why you might care about these one-dimensional problems. Um, there are rare cases where we can actually do numerics on a correlated system well beyond what we can diagonalize. The scale of the numerics is more than 100 spins for the various things I'll talk about. Uh, so the way that they fit together, I mentioned that 2019 paper saying that at infinite temperature, um, the Heisenberg point seems to be in the Cardar Prezi Zhang universality class. Um, so we did a lot of numerics uh, in the paper shown here on a bunch of different models to try to understand what are the essential ingredients for KPZ. Um, so in other words, which spin chains uh, seem to have this behavior. And the main result from looking at higher spin chains in various terms and so on is that you need both integrability and some notion of isot isotropy or a non-abelian symmetry um, and I think I do have a reference to the theory paper that I hope at least two of the authors are here. I hope they'll talk about it later in the meeting. Um, but I think it's now pretty understood, maybe not the full uh, Cardar Prezi Zhang part, but at least the part that Z is equal to three halves when you have the combination of integrability and isotropy, which was the, the conjecture based on a lot of numerics in that paper. If you move away from that point, and in particular, uh, as you lower the temperature, this is stable. It just onsets at a different time that I'll talk about. Um, but if you move away from the Heisenberg point, then you either get z equal to one or z equal to two. So this is sort of the way things fit together. So in other words, at least from the point of view of parameters in the Hamiltonian, you might worry that KPZ looks a little bit unstable. You know, how do you find a system that happens to be right at the Heisenberg point? 
Well, this is one of the few cases where maybe solids do have an advantage over atomic type experiments. Um, so I did want to mention, I think the other experiments out there on uh, generalized hydrodynamics are by Bouchoul with uh, Jerome Debye in France. And those are atomic systems and they're closer to lieb linegar And that means it's, it's not very natural to get to this kind of integrable isotropic point that's supposed to be KPZ. Um, the advantage of solids is that solids are crystals. They can be crystals and crystals have symmetries. So if you grow the right crystal, it will naturally put you at or uh, extremely close to the Heisenberg point. And that's been known for a long time. Um, so I'm going to focus on this Cartar Parisi Zhang super diffusive behavior now and whether it's, it's there in actual three dimensional solids, uh, to what extent it's there. Um, and then I'll come back to one dimension and talk a little bit about other kinds of integrability breaking. All right. So here's the compound. And the basic idea of this paper, which came out earlier this year, was um, let's go back to one of the most studied one dimensional spin chain compounds. And in fact, the compound that taught us a lot about how spin-ons and things like that appear in nature. Um, and it turns out that we just want to take the same compound, but look in a different spot. And I'll explain what that means. So it's not where neutron scatters have normally looked. Uh, but the idea was to go try and convince the senior people who had done the old experiments that they had missed something and that they needed to go back and try again, uh, because we thought that might be a little bit more convincing than finding some other set of people. And uh, there is a happy ending where even on only the second or third data collection, um, it became pretty clear that there was something there that was not explained by the usual assumption of spin diffusion. Um, so this, the point is this is a cubic crystal. That means um, the, 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 it is spin half also, and it is uh, a three-dimensional crystal, which means that at some low temperature, roughly 25 Kelvin, um, the spin chains do couple to each other and there is three-dimensional order. Um, so we're going to have to work at high enough temperatures that it is behaving like a one-dimensional system. Um, the challenge of that is, you know, at high temperatures, you might think, well, spin is not a perfectly conserved quantity. You can lose spin angular momentum to phonon angular momentum through spin orbit coupling, for example. Um, so this is certainly described by the one-dimensional Heisenberg model to some approximation. But the question is, you know, are the approximations made there um, so bad that they destroy the appearance of KPZ. Um, so at best, we're hoping for some kind of intermediate time range. Uh, but let me explain why this is different from what people normally do. Um, so where this compound appeared in the history of one-dimensional physics before was people would go to low temperature and look for in the ground state evidence of spin-ons. In other words, the particular dispersion relation, um, in other words, low temperature and up to quite high frequency um, that would tell you that in one dimension, you don't have magnons, you have spin half spin-ons instead. Um, so what we're going to do here is the opposite. Instead of high frequency and low temperature, we're going to go to low frequency and high temperature. So we're focused on the lowest frequencies because of those are the longest times where you might expect hydrodynamical behavior. Um, and we're going to work as high as room temperature. Uh, obviously, you know, the original paper in, from 2019 was on infinite temperature. You can't really take solids to infinite temperature but we can go up to temperatures that are comparable to or a bit larger than the, the J scale, the scale of the coupling in the Heisenberg model and ask what we see. So our goal is to look in some window of frequency. You can't go down really to zero frequency um, because of experimental reasons. You get in the noise of the elastic scattering line at strictly zero frequency. So, um, so this window is about 0.7 up to two. That's where we have access. Um, and that does limit the amount of time since we can't go down to zero frequency, we can only go to some finite time. And you might worry, is that time long enough to see any signature of KPZ? Um, so I think, uh, yeah, as, as I mentioned, I, I should say the proposals for KPZ started around 2017, but I think that yeah, the, the paper that I would refer people to is this 2019 one. Um, so what we're going to do, maybe the bottom line here is the only new thing, uh, is to look for KPZ scaling and more precisely to look for Z equal to three halves by uh, looking at small fixed wave vector and integrating over frequency. And that should give me a non-trivial power law in the dependence on wave vector. Um, again, this is the crystal structure. Um, the right side is what we're looking for. So let's go ahead and, and see what the data look like. So neutron scattering measures uh, the spin structure factor in Fourier space, so-called S of Q omega, basically the spin-spin correlation function. Um, so we are integrating it 
over a window in omega from 0.7 to 2 MeV and looking at that as a function of Q. And the prediction from Z equal to three halves would be that this should go like Q to the minus three halves uh, as opposed to Z equal to one, which would mean Q to the minus one or diffusion Q to the minus two. Um, so the different things shown here, uh, the left curves are a bit different from the, the right curves as far as uh, the, the black lines, the data are the same. Um, these are all data at different temperatures. You can see the range of temperatures is from 75 Kelvin up to 300 Kelvin. The black curves on the left are from those numerical computations. And in other words, we can see that the numerical computations agree quite well with the data. And we know that in the numerical com computation, it is Z equal to three halves in KPZ. Um, as I mentioned, we can't go down to the smallest Q because the smallest Q would need the smallest frequencies and the smallest frequencies are not the ones we have. Suppose you said, well, if I didn't know anything about numerics and I just asked what is the best fit to the data? Well, we only have about one decade in the data, say, um, but if you look at the black line here, for example, you can see that it does fit the data better than either diffusion or is equal to two. Um, so I guess the way I would describe it is as follows. I wouldn't say it proves that Z is equal to three halves. It is much more consistent with Z equal to three halves than with Z equal to one or Z equal to two. So in other words, there seems to be a time window, even in a three-dimensional solid, even at high temperature, um, where the dynamics is much closer to KPZ-like than it is to ballistic or diffusive. And that was kind of the, the pleasant surprise, because as I mentioned, the advantage of solids is that they get you to the Heisenberg point. The disadvantage is that there are a million other things going on besides the one-dimensional electron physics that you want. Um, but whatever those other things are, so in other words, if, if we went down you know, to even lower frequencies, we would expect maybe a little bit more KPZ behavior, but ultimately it, I think it has to be diffusive because it's certainly, you know, got too many other interactions besides the Heisenberg point. Um, but whatever those interactions are, they don't seem to destroy stuff over this range of energies. Um, so maybe the last thing I'll say about this problem is uh, one reason why uh, we wanted to go back and talk to this Oak Ridge uh, neutron scattering group is that, you know, aside from spin-ons, the low temperature physics of this material and of one dimensional spin chains is very well described by the idea of the Luttinger liquid, which is uh, ballistic, at least if you throw away the perturbations to it. So in other words, we expect that at low temperatures, the dynamics of the system are ballistic and then at high temperatures, they're KPZ. More precisely um, in the integrable spin chain, we would expect it eventually to be KPZ, but the time it takes for KPZ to onset uh, depends on where you are in temperature. And that's kind of the point of the top right curve. Um, so in other words, uh, even as we change the temperature, we always eventually see something that looks like KPZ, but we might have to wait quite a long time. The horizontal axis is time on a log scale. We might have to wait quite a long time for the KPZ behavior, the T to the minus two thirds scaling to set in. Um, but it does always seem to set in and you can fit the onset. So there's a kind of crossover in space and time between Luttinger liquid physics and KPZ physics. Um, and the, the power laws for that crossover are not so different from what you would have guessed, things like one over temperature. Um, so to kind of try to lead in to other talks, and I'm just guessing what people will talk about in this meeting, uh, I think there, there is uh, now an analytical understanding of uh, why we saw what we did in numerics in other words, why some spin chains are KPZ and others aren't. Um, that is this uh, 20, I'm sure it's published now. I just didn't update the reference. That's this 2020 paper by uh, Ilyevsky et al. Um, and there are also ideas about how, you know, why is it the full KPZ universality class? And I hope that other people in the meeting will talk about this. I think I will talk about other things since I didn't work on this. Um, but I, I guess I, I tried to, you know, use the right nuanced word in the top line. The data are, uh, they support Z equal to 1.5 more than one or two, but with neutrons, you can't see the spectral function. You can just see Z. Um, so, but we can see Z numerically at least, um, sorry, KPZ numerically. Um, we are trying to do some other tests, like get a large enough magnetic field to modify the system and maybe study the crossover experimentally in more detail. That's kind of in progress. Um, but now I think I'll move on to other ways of breaking integrability and, and come back to this Luttinger liquid idea. Um, because there's one where I think an experiment might be feasible and I find it kind of interesting. Sure. Um, so, yeah. Sure. Sure. Sorry. So I think uh, you have mostly uh, fo focused on the exponent, but uh, is it very difficult to try to see the scaling function 
Um, I think, you know, with the neutron experiments, uh, it is difficult to get a broad enough range of anything to see differences between the KPZ shape and other things you would see. So I, I, I suspect that's always going to be hard. Uh, maybe, you know, in other words, I think it, we can do it with numerics and we could try to find other experiments, but at least the current state of the neutron scattering data I've seen uh, would not differentiate well between the KPZ shape and other shapes. Hmm. Did you kind of try to see the match between uh, we didn't we, <laughs> uh, we didn't try very hard, uh, but I, I mean, I guess, I mean, okay, the, let me maybe explain why it's a bit of a problem. So uh, in order to get, okay, there's a lot of noise in neutrons because you have a, you know, you have just statistical noise because you only have a finite number of neutrons. So one way that we reduced, we effectively reduced the noise was this integration over frequency. Um, so I guess I think that it, okay, one in principle could run the experiment with a very, very long time to reduce the statistical noise and try to get a big enough range of Q and omega to look for KPZ. So I don't know that it's a problem in principle, um, I, but it is, a, it is a problem that, you know, from the data we had, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it, you know, they would have to retake a much better set of data with the, uh, yeah, so in other words, I think by, by looking at this sort of marginal integration over omega, uh, the noise goes down and you can see something that looks, you know, not perfectly like 1.5, but close, but the scaling function would look very noisy from the data they have uh, when we tried to make a picture. Then, so do you think uh, if, if one, somebody spent, you know, enough money and uh, do the <laughs> kind of experiment at present, there is a possibility that uh, one can really see the scaling function in neutral experiment? I'm still honestly not, Sure, because the, the largest differences, let me maybe go back to a picture of the KPZ scaling function. Uh, which I think I had in the 2019, yeah. Um, well, I guess this doesn't really have the comparison to Gaussian, but the largest differences are kind of out in the tails where you have relatively less magnitude. Yeah. Um, so it would be, and I guess that's just saying it would be a lot of money <laughs> because, you know, it, the, it's the rare points, it's the points where there's less signal that really tell you the difference strongly. Like, you know, you could see something curving in the middle that is consistent with KPZ, but a skeptic would say, well, this could also be consistent with Gaussian or something. Um, so that, that's why I, I guess, you know, even numerically, it's not entirely easy. Uh, it, so the, it's much easier to see z equal to three halves numerically than it is KPZ. And experimentally, I think we can see something strongly suggestive of three halves, uh, but the full scaling function, um, I, I, I guess maybe way to put it is, I hope there's a better way than neutrons. Uh, that might be where to look. Yeah. Well, probably, uh, you know, the, the experiment by Takeuchi using liquid crystal for the distribu trace even distribution, no? For the height fraction. I've heard of it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, that's yeah, right. if you had, a, yeah. I think the problem is we have better ways that, that okay, there, there are various ways to measure spin in a solid, but I think the problem is that the, uh, there are some that are much longer time scales where I suspect it would become diffusive. So that if, in other words, I think neutrons are kind of good in that these frequencies like 0.7 MeV up to two MeV say is the frequency range here. That's, that corresponds to the right time scale before it becomes totally diffusive. Um, I'll tell you one thing that we thought about you know, that's a frequency range where it's possible to work with optics. The problem is the natural length scale for optics is too large compared to a single spin. But there are some limits where people can do optical measurements of S of Q omega. It's just unfortunately that Q tends to be too small. Um, but so I, I guess I, I yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure that with neutrons, it'll be possible to get the noise down enough to say anything about the scaling function. I guess that's all I can say. Yeah, right, thank you very much. Yeah, so thank you. And on to uh, Luttinger liquids in a different sense. And the idea here is going to be, okay, well, that previous case shows that at least in one material, uh, things are pretty close to integrable. Um, actually, all one-dimensional metals at low temperature are in a sense close to integrable because one-dimensional metals are not Fermi liquids, they're Luttinger liquids, which means their low temperature physics in a sense is the free boson. And the free boson is not just integrable, it's free, um, and things move ballistically. But the reason why that's a little bit dangerous to say, uh, I, there's, I guess the way Roman and I referred to it in a review article some time ago is that 
you know, the, the Luttinger liquid is the right low temperature limit and it has maybe irrelevant perturbations to it, but those irrele irrelevant perturbations are dynamically dangerous if they break integrability, because it means at very long times, um, once you've broken integrability, you do expect that things will not be ballistic forever. They do induce scattering and I'll show you some data where we can see that kind of thing. Um, but then you could ask, okay, well, does that mean that at any non-zero temperature, you're stuck with just getting back to diffusive behavior in a, in a one-dimensional metal? Um, and the answer is it depends on what experiment you do. And there's a, a nice simple experiment that I think could be done optically um, and is a nice way to tell apart ballistic from diffusive from something else. And it, it gives rise to a different kind of super diffusion from KPZ super diffusion. So what I want to talk about is that if I took a one-dimensional metal and I heated up one part of it. Let's say the one dimensional metal is very cold. It's well in the Luttinger liquid regime, but then I dump a lot of energy, say with a laser into the center of my one dimensional wire, that energy will spread out. And it turns out that it doesn't spread perfectly ballistically, but it also doesn't spread diffusively. Um, it actually will spread super diffusively. Um, and I want to sort of give a picture of why that's true. And then numerics, which are much richer than the picture, so we don't completely understand them, but at least the, the theory model does correctly predict the super diffusion. Um, but these, these are just five different ways that things are known to move around in solids. You know, you could have localized, subdiffusive, diffusive, super diffusive, ballistic, say. Um, so I want to talk about super diffusive spread of energy in Luttinger liquids. Um, so now I want to uh, advertise one sort of laboratory for uh, generic or non-integrable Luttinger liquid physics that we've used for a while because it's about the simplest model that lets you study these things, which is to take the XXC spin chain. And now I'm going to add the last term. If the last term is random, we can do stuff like MBL. But if the last term is alternating, say positive, in other words, it's like a magnetic field that's up on even sites and down on odd sites, then we can use that to break the integrability, um, but still get a metal, at least if we're in the right parameters of the Luttinger liquid. So this is like a you know, spinless fermion model, if you prefer, with alternating potential. Um, so just to prove to you that we can really see Luttinger liquid physics, uh, the idea of the Luttinger liquid is that there's a very universal free boson description of gapless one-dimensional boson or fermion systems here, say. Um, that applies to the free energy, it applies to the correlations and so on. Here's a test of the correlations. Um, so one neat way to tell apart the Luttinger liquid and the Fermi liquid is that the Fermi liquid has a step function in the occupancy of momentum states as you cross the Fermi level. If you look at the inset in the top left, the Luttinger liquid has these kind of uh, cusps where there is a singularity, but it's only a power law singularity. It's not a step function. And that translates in correlation functions to power laws. And the, the pictures, let me not get into the details, but they're basically showing that we can check using numerics. It's more a test on the numerics, I would say, that we can recover the leading and subleading power laws of correlation functions in the Luttinger liquid. So we know how to recognize a Luttinger liquid when it pops out of the computer. Um, but now let's try adding things to break the integrability. So this is that staggered magnetic field I talked about. And what Christoph Karish did back when he was a postdoc at Berkeley uh, was effectively trace out a renormalization group trajectory. In other words, a bunch of parameter values that are all asymptotically the same Luttinger liquid with the same exponents, um, but the parameter values differ in how strong the integrability breaking is. And a way to know that the integrability breaking is there is to look at the level statistics and to see that the level statistics, when I turn off the staggered field, the level statistics are Poisson, there's no level repulsion. And as I crank up this term, uh, it does what we'd expect, the level statistics cross over from Poisson to Wigner Dyson. Um, so if you want, you know, integrability is certainly the most beautiful point, but if you want to understand uh, cases where it's still the same metallic phase, but it's no longer integrable, then you can just situate yourself some point on this trajectory. So now let's ask one question, which is how does just the linear response conductivity vary as you move along that trajectory? And it does what Luttinger liquid aficionados would expect. It blows up as a power law in temperature as temperature goes to zero. So in other words, this is sort of the general behavior we would expect from um, irrelevant perturbations that break integrability. Because if I'm at finite temperature and I have the perturbation there, I would expect a finite conductivity. But the fact that it's irrelevant means that the conductivity blows up as T goes to zero. So now, um, but so this is in other words, all about linear response. 
Um, but it leads to kind of an interesting nonlinear response question, which is the one I asked at the beginning. Um, suppose I take a lump of energy at the origin and watch it expand. And the, the main point of this little theoretical model at the top is even if you assume local thermalization, if you have an expansion into the ground state, you will get something nonlinear and not diffusive. Uh, you'll get the so-called fast diffusion equation, which has various solutions. And the point is just, if you believe that, let's focus on energy to make it generic. Um, if you believe that the thermal conductivity has a power law behavior as T goes to zero, then if you write continuity of energy and plug that in, um, all of a sudden you no longer get diffusion. You get diffusion if kappa is linear in T, Otherwise you get something faster than diffusion. So even if things are thermalizing more than they actually do, you still won't get ordinary diffusion. So now what we can do is say, okay, well, this was a toy model. Um, you know, it will predict a continuously variable uh, dynamical critical exponent where the dynamical exponent is related to what power law I put in my linear conductivity at low temperature. Um, so does this capture something about the actual system? In other words, if I take one of these generic Luttinger liquids with broken integrability, heat up the center and watch it spread, how does energy expand? Does it expand super diffusively? Um, so the answer is yes, it expands super diffusively, but the shape is not what you get from that simple toy model. That toy model gives you kind of flat top shapes, but they don't have this uh, two peak structure. Um, but the main point of this is, you do still get super diffusion. In other words, you get a scaling collapse for long times um, that is certainly not diffusive, but not ballistic either. Uh, you get different, you get as predicted by the simple model, um, you get different scaling exponents depending on where exactly you are in the Luttinger liquid. In other words, what is kappa looking like at low T? So I guess the way I would summarize it is the following. The theoretical argument, just to be clear on what it does and doesn't say, the theoretical argument is just saying that if you had local thermalization and if you had a power law conductivity, then you will in general get fast diffusion or super diffusion. Um, it's a well-known nonlinear PDE with various known solutions. The relevant one here is this barren blatt paddle solution. Uh, that's not exactly what you see numerically because numerically it's not fully thermalizing. Um, it's spreading faster than it can completely thermalize. Um, so if you like what's going on in this system, but I think the, the, the point is, I think this is the way real one-dimensional metals will behave if they're cold and you heat up the center. Um, the basic idea is that it's not linear response because if the outside is temperature equal to zero and the inside is any finite temperature, that's not actually the linear response limit. What you will get is uh, a competition between the rate at which energy moves and the rate at which things thermalize. And that competition is a different mechanism for super diffusion. Um, and that, that, I guess, this collapse is the, the point of these numerical curves. So a, a challenge problem that we were not able to solve is can you develop the hydrodynamical theory well enough to understand this two I'd be happy to you know, give anyone tons of detail if anyone is interested in that problem, but we, we were not able to improve, say, the hydrodynamical equations uh, to capture all the details but at least the super diffusive is the main uh, qualitative result. Um, and again, you know, you can see collapses and different, uh, you can confirm that it is linear response if you just slightly heat the center to like T plus Delta when the whole chain is at some non-zero temperature T. So in other words, this is a system, the, the generic Luttinger liquid is a funny case where it's a system that um, linear response is valid for small temperature perturbations. But if the background is cold, then a finite lump of energy is not really a small linear response perturbation and it spreads rapidly. Um, so in other words, the way you'd want to do the experiment is get your Luttinger liquid very cold, heat up a point and watch it spread. And uh, we've talked to people, but so far we, I don't think we've convinced anyone to seriously give it a try. So if you have friends, please uh, pass it on. All right, so I think if I could have maybe uh, five more minutes, I know I'm nominally at time, but- uh, No problem, yeah, just go ahead. Yeah, so I'll, I'll quickly just mention the other kind of integrability that I think is most relevant to experiments. And then uh, a recent paper that has many other things besides this, but I feel I should mention it because it just came on the archive. Um, so what we did a couple of years ago was instead of solids, uh, let's think about atomic physics. And the most common kind of integrability there is uh, a harmonic trap. So you might have a model that is integrable on the line, but you add some, say, quadratic V of X. Uh, and the 
hard rod problem is one of the classical examples of uh, non-trivial hydrodynamics in one dimension, uh, studied very thoroughly. Um, so what I quickly want to show is um, how hydrodynamics is still useful even beyond the kind of nearly exact dynamical equation I talked about before. So this is all classical physics and uh, I'm unfortunately not gonna be able to give much of the history in the interest of time for why this hard rod problem is so beautiful. Um, but a, a way to think about, you know, why this is experimentally motivated, this is an atomic physics experiment from some time ago that they described in terms of a Newton's cradle, this sort of toy you might have on your desktop. Uh, we are interested in just watching a bunch of interacting rods in this quadratic potential that breaks their integrability um, and asking what happens as a result of the integrability breaking. Um, and there are basically three regimes. The first one is the kind of regime I've already talked about where hydrodynamical equations are valid. Um, the second regime is the onset of chaos. And the one which is maybe uh, pleasantly interesting is the third regime. Um, so in other words, you know, as I mentioned before, the kind of integrable or kinetic equation for integral models that we used for the spin chains also works for classical systems. In particular, it would work for hard rods on the line. So if you take hard rods on the line, write down the kinetic equation you would get and just add a force from the trap, you will get something that works for some amount of time. It doesn't work forever because the trap has broken the integrability and you get the onset of chaos. Uh, that's step two. Um, so step one is like what I talked about before. Step two is the onset of chaos. But for the longest times we can observe, we don't see full thermalization. Um, we do see a steady state. And that steady state is another case where hydrodynamical equations are useful. So that was maybe the pleasant surprise. Um, so the uh, continuum hydrodynamics of this model in the form that we use it was written down by Perkis. And you can see it's you know, very much the same kind of Boltzmann equation I wrote down before, where the velocity at one space time point is a function of all the other uh, what all the other rods are doing at that space time point. Um, so we can, we can figure out, you know, when does the onset of chaos happen? I don't know that that's hugely surprising. Um, so the final state though, in other words, we might've, what I think we expected beforehand was that we would get chaos, we would get thermalization, and then we get a Maxwellian distribution. Instead, we do not get things that are very Maxwellian, at least for the thousands of periods or so we can wait. Um, but they are described by, uh, in other words, we don't just get one possible solution, the Maxwellian solution, we get many different possible solutions of a kind of hydrodynamical equilibrium. Um, so, you know, going back to three rods, you can kind of study the onset of integrability and chaos. The way we look at it, um, and I have the, the reference, but it's uh, Shang Yu Kao, Veer Bolchandani and I, um, is that hydrodynamics is still useful even without a time derivative as a constraint on the steady state final ensemble. And here, I really don't know whether this is true out to infinite time. Um, I still suspect that you know if we waited more than the 10 to the fifth periods, we can wait for small systems and maybe a thousand periods with lots of rods, um, that maybe things will ultimately pick out the one of the hydrodynamical equilibria that is thermodynamical equilibrium. Um, but we don't see that. Instead, what we see is, you know, for the, all the averaging we can do, we see various solutions of hydrodynamics. So I guess the main point is that here, um, hydrodynamics is not just useful for time evolution. It seems to give a constraint on non-thermal final ensembles in this problem. Um, and then a question you might ask that was one motivation for this recent paper down at the bottom is, there are a few models where adding a trap doesn't break the integrability. And the most famous one is like Collagero type particles with inverse square laws. Um, so one of, of many things in this paper down at the bottom uh, with other people who are here today is to try to develop the kinetic theory for these inverse square interactions, which are really quite interesting and subtle. And there's some beautiful mathematical physics in this paper, I think I can say it's beautiful because I didn't contribute to that part. Uh, but the part in the trap um, and understanding how that works is kind of a neat case where indeed, as you would expect, you can go to very long times for these inverse square particles and you don't see the onset of chaos. Again, hard to say whether that lasts forever, but at least uh, the theory does correctly predict that um, some models are much more, I don't know, integrable hydrodynamical in a trap than others. So I think that's what I wanted to wrap up with. There may be three quick messages. So one is um, 
you know, the, the beautiful mathematical physics of hydrodynamics and integral models um, is not totally decoupled from the real world. It seems like both in that atomic experiment I mentioned by Bouchoul in Dubai and in this uh, potassium copper fluoride experiment, there are signs of things that we would not have understood without the recent progress on generalized hydrodynamics of various kinds. Uh, and then a different sense in which you can get super diffusion is that I think certain problems in one dimensional metals are likely to be super diffusive. Um, even if the system has a well-defined linear response limit, it's just that you can ask questions like the expansion of a lump of energy into the vacuum that wind up never quite collapsing into linear response. Um, and there, that's because of a competition between thermalization and the Luttinger liquid. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, just to try to complete the study of real world perturbations to integrability, um, it seems like you know, TRAP does ultimately destroy integrability, um, but hydrodynamics is still useful in a funny way, even in kind of the generic case. And then if you go to these special Collagero particle models, um, then it seems like the TRAP, as you might guess, uh, does not seem very efficient at breaking the integrability even for very long times. Um, so with that, uh, let me maybe thank the various people involved. So um, a lot of these alumni are, are here, uh, but as far as the new people in the group, uh, so Nick Sherman and Maxime Dupont did a lot of the numerics. Maxime is moving to Rigetti quantum computing quite soon. Uh, we had a great time working with the experimentalists at Oak Ridge. That's Alan Shea as a postdoc and Alan Tennant and Steve Nagler are two of the great experts on spin chains for decades now. Um, so I think I'd better stop there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. A very nice talk. Uh, are there any questions, comments? You can maybe show some. Yeah, uh, maybe we, st we start from Abhishek, please. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah. for this, uh, when you look at the spread of this lump of energy, I mean, uh, if the background was at a finite temperature, then I guess you expect that uh, you expect, you will observe the uh, expected super diffusive behavior and the correct scaling, is that correct? No, I think I think the background really has to be at at, zero, at close to zero temperature for it to work. So, for example, what I what I mean is at least there are two limits that that we did study. Uh, one is that okay, suppose the background was all at you know some high temperature like two hundred Kelvin, and then we we heat one part of it to two hundred and one Kelvin, um, then that will be diffusive and that will have a finite conductivity. So, I guess the point is you know where this is all coming from is really this fact that the conductivity is blowing up at low temperature. But if I, if I don't have any part of the sample that's at low temperature, then the conductivity is finite everywhere and things will basically be diffusive. So it, it's true that the real mechanism for the super diffusion uh, is being cold and picking up the effects of this power law divergence in the conductivity. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, so then, Jacopo? Jacopo, yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah, so a question about the experiment. Um, so do you expect that, um, uh, so you were saying that, that you, uh, I mean, one should expect in it uh, breaking, I mean, additional attempts to the Eisenberg chain coming from example from uh, interaction with phonons. And uh, um, well, on the other hand, uh, well, okay, now there is this uh, idea more or less that, um, uh, the KPZ exponent uh, should at least uh, kind of survive at intermediate times if you don't break the SU2 symmetry, but if you break it, so you should get straight diffusion from very short times. And I was wondering, indeed, what's, uh, do you think that like this uh, um, additional terms uh, that you have in the solid uh, should respect the SU2 symmetry or not? I think you know what's special about the spin half model and a cubic crystal is basically the following. So suppose I ask you know what are the leading additional terms I could write down. So there's no uh, on-site isotro anisotropy for spin half. In other words, I can't write down like SX squared or SC squared because those just become the identity. If I had higher spin, then I, I could have on-site anisotropy, but I can't for spin half uh, because the, they reduce to the identity. Okay. 
Um, and then the other, so then the, the, the other way I could have anisotropy within the spin part of the Hamiltonian is um, I could have anisotropy in the couplings. Like I could have JX different from JZ say, uh, but that's where the, the cubic symmetry uh, makes that difficult. So I guess what that's saying is the things that will push me away from anisotropy will have to be sort of mediated by something other than just the pure spin model. Like for example, there will be some very weak coupling between spin and phonons. And it could be that one spin couples to a phonon and then that phonon couples back to a spin. And if I integrated out the phonons, I would generate something that would be a tiny bit anisotropic. But the reason why that's still hard is, you know, with just two spin couplings with spin half and cubic symmetry, uh, you're very constrained in what you could write down. So I, I guess the way to state it is spin half cubic crystals um, have much weaker coupling between spin and phonons than generic crystals. And I think that that's kind of a known fact that you can see in various ways experimentally. And I think that's a large part of why this works because 300 Kelvin is a high temperature. And if you took, you know, a higher spin material or a non-cubic material, I think spin would stop being conserved on the time scales being observed. In other words, you're not even guaranteed to get diffusion. Um, but here, yeah, the, the spin lifetime in this particular crystal is very long, which is one reason why people have used it for many years. But experimentalists don't know. I mean, I don't know. I guess they study a lot of these things. Uh, do, do they know the, um, what are the, is there any phenomenological model uh, to incorporate this, um, these terms? Or um, I, I have not seen known? one. I mean, the, the way people, the main people who I think think about terms like that are on longer time scales than neutron scattering. They're doing things like, like NMR, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. And there, um, I mean, I, I, all, yeah, that's all I know is the conventional wisdom, I guess, that the simplest relaxation terms that dominate in most materials vanish here because of symmetries. I think you're right. There have to be some higher order relaxation terms. I don't know. A, yeah, I, I wish I could point you to a reference, but I don't know a good one for a phenomenological model of that. Okay, thanks. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Maybe not. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, if not, uh, uh, let's thank uh, Joel again.